What is up, Abe Bush? It's been a long day of working and of uh, talking to students about their extra credit DBQs. Um, if you do have, if you are signed up for your extra credit DBQ to talk with me about it, um, that's great. I, I think it's it's really helpful to be able to talk to students specifically about their about their essays and their writing. Um, I've seen some really, really good ones so far, so I'm feeling very confident. And we are getting into our last lectures um, for APUSH, getting, coming into the kind of final eras of um, what we'll be tested on. And so today, uh, we are talking again about the Gilded Age, 1865 to 1898. Um, Last class, we talked all about the uh, second industrial revolution, steel and electricity and the factory system and laissez-faire government and big business and political machines and all of those things. Today, we're going to talk about the West. Um, and the West is, is kind of the forgotten region of the United States because the West is really its own separate region in the sense that it has become the, the breadbasket of the United States and the world. There's so many farmers moving out west, the first cowboys, the first wheat farmers and corn farmers. Um, however, in this time period, um, and in this really big westward migration period, we were going to see an unprecedented amount of um, conflicts with Native Americans, some really, really nasty conflicts with Native Americans. And in general, um, we'll see that the treatment of Native Americans is so bad in this time period that Many Americans just would just shoot Native Americans on site without even discussing with them, without talking to them. And um, that kind of sets the tone for some of the really nasty, bloody situations that go on in the 1860s and 1870s, which is called our Indian War era. And so certainly the Homestead Act will, will lead to this because of all the people moving west that way and because of the end of the fighting. So the Indian War era um, will have some conflicts that we need to learn about and discuss. Um, and then once all of these Americans have moved West and have devoted themselves to farming, we see that the West becomes a power politically. And in fact, becomes the, this is the heights of Western politics, um, as far as farming politics, um, especially with the populace, um, and their calls for uh, regulation of railroads and especially currency currency. I know it's boring, but we have big debates over currency that we need to know about. Um, in general, the West is always in debt, and so they are always calling for really three things. They want low interest loans, they want more paper currency, and they want silver. And paper currency and silver go hand in hand. They want inflation because they want to be able to pay back their loans with depreciated dollars. Um, Dawes Severalty Act is a big one as far as our Indian War era. We'll talk a lot about the Dawes Severalty Act. Um, and so this is kind of the context of where we're at right now, guys. Here we are after the Civil War, um, and we have the entire eastern portion of the United States completely populated and carved into new states. And then, of course, we have California, Nevada, and Oregon over there in the west that were brought in um, in the 1840s and 50s with the Compromise of 1850 and Oregon fever, and then Nevada had a, a, a pretty large gold rush itself. Um, but the middle of the United States, the, what was called the Great West at this time period, is, is relatively uninhabited. Um, and this is where the Indians roam. And this is um, very um, available land in the eyes of white settlers, but in the eyes of um, the Native Americans, this is where they have been pushed to and where they are now treating as their ancestral lands. And of course, we're going to have a conflict between um, Native Americans and uh, Americans. Um, obviously we had Native Americans that are, that are pushed eastward and many groups like the Sioux that were living in the Great Lakes region now in the Great Plains region. And, uh, they had to completely adapt to their way of life in the Great Lakes region. They have access to water and so they could have a sedentary society and, and use agriculture out West on the Great Plains. Agriculture was very difficult to sustain and the, and the topography wasn't right for it. And so um, they're going to start hunting the buffalo and they become nomadic buffalo hunters. And so um, now we see that our, our American settlers are, are coming in and engaging um, these Great Plains tribes. And so um, what we see is that Native Americans will be pushed on to reservations and then whites will move on to those reservations as well as even and even break those promises. Um, 
of course, the problems that we always have when we see new settlers coming into previously untouched or relatively untouched lands inhabited by Native Americans that will see disease, cholera, toy, typhoid, and the big one, smallpox. And then the ecological imperialism that occurs as a result, especially the buffalo, the poor buffalo, tens of millions of buffaloes uh, roamed the plains before um, Americans moved in. And then um, they're now to the point of almost extinction. Um, all right, so the U.S. treatment of Plains Indians. Um, in the 1850s, um, the U.S. government attempted to sign treaties with different chiefs and tribes. But of course, that's very contradictory because many of these Native American societies are living in kinship groups, that they, they aren't um, beholden to one chief and they don't call themselves a tribe. And so by signing a deal with one person doesn't mean that you are able to regulate someone in the same quote unquote tribe um, just because the American government says so. And so what we have is, is these boundaries that are enforced upon these tribes um, that in actuality are pretty much ignored or misunderstood. And the United States is believing that they are now in these reservations. Um, in the 1860s, Native Americans are herded even to smaller reservations Although there were some big ones, and the biggest was what we call the Great Sioux Reservation, which was in the Montana Territory, which is modern day South Dakota, especially. Um, we also see lots of corruption about um, money that was supposed to be um, designated to these um, reservations, instead making their way into federal agents' um, pockets. And so we had several um, controversies over that. But the two major conflicts, or we really have three major conflicts in this Indian War era that we talk about um, that is going to define the Indian War era, are the Sand Creek Massacre, the Fetterman Massacre, and then um, our Battle of Little Bighorn. Um, so the Sand Creek Massacre is absolutely the U.S. government uh, coming in and just committing an atrocity. This is um, very similar to the Vietnam era with the My Lai Massacre, where there was just... Um, men, women, and children unarmed, praying for mercy, and the U.S. government comes in and massacres this group. Uh, Colonel Shivington is to blame for this. He was held accountable for his actions. He, uh, his his um, men turned on him in the court of law. Um, but this kind of set the stage for how the U.S. government was treating Native Americans out in the West. And as a result of this, obviously Native Americans feel as though they are going to be attacked. And they struck back. The Sioux um, are going to strike back in 1866 um, with something called the Fetterman Massacre, which was actually now going the opposite direction, where Native Americans commit a, a massacre upon um, the American government, in this case, um, the American army, um, because Captain Fetterman is ambushed. Um, now, what was going on was the U.S. government was attempting to construct something called the Bozeman Trail. The Bozeman Trail was a trail that led into Montana, Montana had just experienced a little gold rush in itself. And so we saw Americans constructing this trail to try to move into this territory. Um, obviously, because it is part of an Indian reservation, the Indians aren't so happy about this. And so the Sioux is going to fight back. Um, in this small situation, the Sioux are victorious um, because they have, they have fought off people coming onto their land that has been given to them. And that's our Treaty of Fort Laramie where the U.S. government abandons the Bozeman Trail. Okay, so it seems like even though there was gold discovered in this area, it looks like the Native Americans are going to be able to keep their lands designated to them by the U.S. government. Um, until here we are over here with the little of the Battle of Little Bighorn. So our situation is that um, very infamously, we have General George Custer. And Custer is going to lead a quote-unquote scientific expedition into the Black Hills. Now, the reason for this is that he heavily suspects that there is gold in the Black Hills. Um, there has been rumors of this, and then there's been sightings of um, Sioux Indians that are adorning themselves with gold. And so, sure enough, he marches in with his army um, and announces that he discovers gold. Um, immediately, we see hundreds of settlers flocking into Sioux territory, violating the laws, their own federal laws. Um, and of course, the Sioux leader, Sitting Bull, is not going to allow this. And he's going to rally his, his tribe to um, defend their lands. And Custer is going to march in um, with his force of only 264 men. 
and attack a much larger force of 2,500 men. Custer is killed along with each and every one of his men. And unbelievably, the result is that this is turned into a massacre by the Sioux. The massacre have come in and killed Custer um, and that they must be, he must be avenged. And so the U.S. Army is, is going to turn this into a um, mandate of extinction, of pushing uh, American Indians even further off the lands that they have been pushed on to. And so really, really nasty, hypocritical treatment. But this isn't anything different than, than what has been going on for years and years and years, all the way back even before the Jacksonian era, which we all remember was a terrible time for Native Americans. Um, as we aforementioned, the extinction of the bison, um, tens of millions of buffalo, um, when the Spanish arrived on the Great Plains and our Plains Indians are going to use the buffalo for everything, for food, for clothing, for tools, for weapons. There's 15 million still there on the Western Plains after the Civil War. But building railroads becomes the biggest reason for the extinction of these buffalo because um, so many of these large buffalo herds are on land that was proposed for railroads. And so the railroad companies would actually hire um, buffalo hunters to come out and kill these buffalo mercilessly. That's where we get Buffalo Bill Cody pictured down here. He killed 4,000 buffalo himself working for um, the Kansas Railroad Company, which is, you know, obviously just nasty and mean stuff. Um, and, and they were killed for many reasons, the biggest because of the railroads, but obviously also for their meat and their hides or just amusement. And by 1885, less than a thousand survived. That is just terrible. Um, Helen Hunt Jackson, she is a children's writer from Massachusetts, and yet she makes a large contribution for Native American rights because she writes two books, one especially, A Century of Dishonor, um, that is going to bring to light the very contradictory and hypocritical treatment that the U.S. government has had towards Native Americans. A Century of Dishonor um, outlines the entire history of the U.S. federal government's um, treatment of Native Americans, their broken promises, um, and writes down all of the times in which these kind of atrocities were committed. Ramona was a fictional story, um, but had a similar purpose in, in talking about injustice to the Indians in California. Um, and that brings about the Dawes Severalty Act. And the Dawes Severalty Act is one of our key dates because it, it represents a, a major change um, in the treatment of Native Americans because there's constantly the debate going on what to do about Native Americans. Do you force them to assimilate or do you allow them to live on these reservations or force them to live on these reservations would be a better term. Um, and so the Dawes Severalty Act was kind of a moderation between the two, between these two ideas. And the Dawes Severalty Act is going to say, okay, no longer are we going to recognize tribes. We are going to attempt to assimilate um, American Indians into exactly as white Americans are treated or any Americans are treated. There is no more tribal ownership of land. And just like the Homestead Act, the heads of family of each Indian family will be given 160 acres of lands. But they weren't just given to them like the Homestead Act was. Instead, there was a, a, a provision that said if Indians behave like quote unquote good white settlers, they will get the full title to their land. So they're essentially only renting it for 25 years and um, they will get their citizenship in 25 years. Now, um, this sort of treatment of Native Americans um, and this forced assimilation is not going to be reversed until the New Deal with the quote unquote Indian New Deal with um, FDR, obviously. Okay, um, so these reservation lands, um, we've had lots of um, reservations and these reservations are supposed to be chopped up and given to individual heads of families. Um, that being said, there's less families applying for these lands than there are um, available lands. And so there's some land that hasn't been applied for for heads of Indian families. And so this reservation land, the rest of it, was supposed to be sold to the railroads and any white settlers. And then the federal government was supposed to take the proceeds of those sales and then use them to form schools 
to educate and civilize Native Americans. Yikes. So we've got some social Darwinism going on here. One such example was the Carlisle Indian School, where Native American children were supposed to be taught English and inoculated with American customs. The actual motto of the school was, kill the Indian, save the man. So pretty nasty stuff going on here. Um, okay, so what does the Dawes Act do in its entirety? It strikes at tribes. It abbreviates, it takes away tribal organization um, and tries to make individualists out of our Native Americans. Um, and the casing point is just by 13 years later, our Native Americans have lost 50% of the acres that they had previous to the Pre-Dawes Act. Um, and this forced assimilation policy will go all the way until the Indian New Deal under FDR. Um, okay, the West. Um, the forgotten profession of the West is mining. Um, and that is especially going to come true in these early um, periods and all the way from the 1850s to the 1890s as um, settlers move further and further West, they're going to encounter these little lucky strikes or these gold strikes and they're going to create these boom towns there where hundreds of people, possibly thousands of people, move into these towns and make a profession out of mining until the gold or silver runs out and then they move to the next place. And that really is what's going to start to populate the West. Um, of course, gold was discovered in California in 1850 and then in 1858, Colorado and Nevada. Those were our 59ers that moved into the Rockies. Um, and especially silver is going to be discovered. 340 million gold and silver between 1860 and 1890. And most of these miners are going to be men. I mean, the major, major majority of these miners are going to be men, either single men or the husband that is leaving the family to go out and strike it rich and send money home. Um, and because of this, um, there's such a discrepancy in how many men are out west that there are these, this big call for um, women to come in and po help populate these states. And so um, these Western states are gonna be the first states to win a, a general amount of equality in the sense that uh, many of these Western states are going to get suffrage far earlier than the Eastern states. Wyoming, the equality state, is our first one in 1869. Utah follows suit in 1870. Although I will mention for both of those um, those were territories and they didn't become states um, until the 1890s. And so while they could vote, while women could vote in the territory, they couldn't actually vote in federal elections until the 1890s. Um, the Homestead Act, of course, is the big reason in why the West becomes populated. Um, the federal government gives a head of family 160 acres of land. And the provision is you must pay $30 for it. Um, and you must live on it for at least five years and you must improve the land. And that meant you had to build a house, you had to build a well, and you had to irrigate at least 20 acres of that land. Um, irrigation is a very, very important provision of the Homestead Act because irrigation um, was considered completely, completely necessary. Um, a geologist um, actually made a scientific study of the United States in this time period and, and decided that the all lands west of the 100th meridian, and you can see this map down here, you can see the 100th meridian here, all lands to the west were completely unsuitable for agriculture unless there was a heavy, heavy amount of irrigation that was brought into these lands without heavy irrigation that eventually droughts would become so prevalent that you could not have a sustainable farm there. And yet many Americans took the risk anyway with the Homestead Act and moved further out west. And the unfortunate side effect of this is two thirds of these homesteaders are going to have to sell their land and they're going to sell their land um, largely to land speculators who are going to find more and more land in the hands um, of the rich. Um, and so the Homestead Act, it had some successes. It also had um, some significant failures. Um, I am going to pause right here for a second as I am getting a important call. So I will resume this in just a second. Pause. And I'm back. Okay, so let's get back to it. We were talking about the massive growth of the West. Okay, so 
Um, 18, by 1890, we have six new states joining the Union. North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Washington, Montana, um, Idaho, and Wyoming. Um, Utah has been, you know, populated for far, far longer and could have become a state way quicker. Finally, it bans polygamy and becomes a state in 1896. Um, and then there's the deal with Oklahoma. So the, the tricky thing with Oklahoma is just that Oklahoma has been called Indian Territory um, all the way back and since 1830 with the Indian Removal Act, where all of our Native Americans were moved east of the Mississippi to then west of the Mississippi into Indian Territory. But now, because of the Dawes Severalty Act, this land is now available for settlers. And so um, there will be a land race to see who can come in and claim available land in Oklahoma. Um, and literally, this was where all of these different horses would line up in a line, and then you would fire off the start, and the starter would fire off the gun, and they would all race throughout the plains of Oklahoma and find available land to claim for themselves. Um, well, Obviously, some people tried to cheat the system and came in a little too early, and those people were called the Sooners. They came in too soon, um, and th thus, therefore, Oklahoma becomes called the Sooner State, and it's admitted in 1907. And 1890 is one of our key dates, guys. 1890 is a very, very important date because 1890 is, of course, the closing of the frontier. Um, the Secretary of the Census has decided that there is absolutely no more discernible frontier line, that the entire mainland United States has been added um, to the Union, and that therefore um, there is no available frontier line that people could pick up and leave to and go to for the free land that the United States has always had to offer. And because of this, um, this is a considerable date in, in the United States history. Um, and one of the biggest reasons why is, is because of something that Frederick Jackson Turner outlines in his essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, and the idea that the worker was protected by the existence of the frontier. If you were a, um, a sharecropper in the South or a um, factory worker in the North, that you always had the opportunity to just say, screw it, pick it up and leave and go get some land out West. And that therefore it was a safety valve for the um, lowest members of society in either the North or the South. And that with now the closing of the frontier that this uh, no longer represented this opportunity. And for many, this was a startling realization. And, and the biggest uh, kind of long-term effect is that this becomes um, the, the reasoning for now expanding outside of the United States and moving into places like the Caribbean, especially. Um, and we'll see that almost immediately in 1898 with the Spanish-American War. Um, out West, uh, we start to talk about our politics of the West. And our politics of the West are tied to the economy of the West. Um, gone are the days of the subsistence farmers where we have um, the, the family that are living off the land by themselves. And they're not really selling anything for export because they've got everything they need on the farm. Nowadays, the West is populated by um, these kind of monopolistic one crop farms, these big bonanza farms, really large, large acreage farms that are devoted to one single cash crop. And to be able to farm like this, you need to have the top of the line mechanization, the top of the line inventions. We talked about the Cyrus McCormick reefer in the previous time period. Now we're talking about the combined reaper thresher. 20 different horses is pulling this kind of big contraption here that's both going to reap the grain and bag the grain. And because of things like this, the West becomes the entire world's um, bread basket. It's producing bread for the entire world. And you have these enormous farms. But of course, the side effect of this is that in order to compete in the West and be able to um, have a luxurious profession, you have to have lots of lands. There's lots of wheat being cultivated. And because of this, in order to make a big profit, you've got to produce lots and lots of wheat because the supply is high, so the price is low. And in order to afford all of that land and to afford a combined reaper thresher, you're going to have to borrow that money. You're going to have to borrow that money from the manufacturer or, or from the state government or the federal government in order to buy the land. And so because of this, 
um, Western farmers were always beholden to the bankers um, and to manufacturers. And because of this, they are constantly always looking um, for ways in which to have an influx of currency into the economy so that when they do pay back their loans, that they do so with deflated currency. Um, okay, so deflation is hurting farmers um, between 1875 and 1879. Um, the reason being is because the Grant administration, you might recall, is going to favor um, gold and gold currency. He's going to um, practice a, a policy of contraction. Um, he, with his Resumption Act in 1875, he promises that he, in order to bring back the value of greenbacks, um, that he is going to withdraw greenbacks from the general population, keep them in the vaults, and therefore the greenbacks that are still out in circulation are going to be worth more because there's less of them. Um, and therefore his, his promise was that greenbacks would be worth um, the proper 32 to 1 ounce of gold. Um, and actually he effectively does this by 1879. Um, but because inflation now, or excuse me, deflation now has occurred, um, our farmers have no way of paying back their debts. And so this is going to be the biggest reason and why farmers are going to have to come together politically in order to um, get some laws passed that will get them either um, inflation or loans. Um, and to make matters worse, there's other factors that are coming in hurting farmers. Um, a, a large swarm of grasshoppers and bull weevils in the early 1890s are going to be killing the, the wheat and the um, cotton, respectively, with the bull weevil. Uh, massive droughts out west as, as pre-warned. Um, high tariffs in the Gilded Age. Um, and the reason why we have so many high tariffs in this, in this age, obviously, is why well, there's really two reasons. One, the Republican Party won the war. And because of the fact that many of our southern states were not reconstructed for half of the Gilded Age, the North continues to pass high tariffs, helping manufacturing. And the other reason is that um, the politicians were beholden to big business, and big business in increasingly demanded high tariffs. And so because of this, um, our poor farmers were absolutely crushed. Um, also, the railroads, um, unregulated during most of the Gilded Age, are going to charge our farmers an arm and a leg to be able to export their products, and they became dangerously, dangerously connected and dependent upon the upon the railroad. Um, and so, fifty percent of the country are still farmers, and yet they're not unionized or organized, and that um, is going to bring about the this change. Now, when it comes to farming, um, we have a tale of two presidents. So. Grover Cleveland's a Democrat, and he is our first Democrat in office since the Civil War ended. Um, and he is a very moderate Democrat in modern in modern times. Um, he's a laissez-faire president. He believes to let business run by itself. But one of the things that he does have a problem with is the tariff. The tariff is incredibly high. It's hurting American farmers. It's helping large business owners, but it's hurting the average American. And he figures, why do we have such a high tariff? Every year we're bringing in, our, our government's bringing in an annual surplus of $145 million. What that means is we are, we are bringing in more money than we're spending as a government. And so then they have to figure out if something to do with that surplus money. And so they end up giving it out to pension payments to union veterans. And so what that really was was just handing back money to northerners that fought in the war. And to many, that's incredibly unfair. And so Cleveland is going to end this practice, and farmers are going to rejoice. Um, the problem is, is that Cleveland um, doesn't stay in office in 1888. Benjamin Harrison is elected president. Um, Benjamin Harrison is going to become president through massive, massive donations from big business. That is his big, what we remember of Benjamin Harrison is that he is going to be beholden to big business. He's only there to protect those big business leaders. And we see that because during his presidency, he signs the McKinley tariff, which was our biggest tariff up until this point in peacetime history. Um, and so our farmers now are incredibly, incredibly disgruntled by this. And this is what's going to cause our farmers to unionize. Um, it starts with our, our grangers. Oh, sorry. A very important um, piece that I missed on um, Benjamin Harrison. 
um, farmers start to mobilize against the Republican Party. They form this Farmers Alliance. In 1890, the congressional elections, um, Republicans have lost the majority in Congress, and our Democrats now are coming out and pushing some laws that are going to help farmers. Um, a huge law to help farmers was the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. This, this, this Sherman Silver Purchase Act um, allowed for silver to be purchased by the U.S. Treasury. Um, and that's huge because we have all of these, um, this huge influx of silver from the West. And um, especially our Westerners, um, there's silver that is very accessible to them. And so if they can sell it to the U.S. Treasury and then get redeemed with these special Treasury notes, then they could exchange it for gold. And so, wow, so now we have access to gold. Gold is the um, basis behind the U.S. currency at this stage. So now silver can be directly exchanged for gold. And this is absolutely huge. But here's our problem. Um, the Treasury, under the Sherman Silver Sur Purchase Act, is overvaluing the rate of silver. And this is part of the plan of our Western congressmen that they were going to make sure that silver was exchanged at a rate of 16 ounces to one. Now, that is way, way higher than what silver is actually worth on the world markets. And so what this actually does is investors, smart investors, are going to buy silver um, at, a, at its cheaper costs somewhere else, exchange it in the U.S. Treasury for gold, and then sell gold internationally and make a profit. And so what has happened here is the Sher this Sherman Silver Purchase Act is overvalued silver to try and help the West. But in the process, we see investors coming in and drain the U.S. Treasury of all the gold that it has. The U.S. Treasury is running out of gold, and you need to have gold in the U.S. Treasury because all of paper currency is based off of gold. And so um, as a result of this, um, we see some, some political change. Now, let's talk about the, the Westerners. Um, it starts as the Grange, and the Grange was actually, funnily enough, um, a bunch of farmers that were trying to, to solve farmer loneliness. Um, very lonely out there on your big farm, and the, the objective was of the grain was to enhance farmers through social, educational, and fraternal activities. They would hold picnics and concerts. But when these farmers came together, they would talk politics, and this became a political sphere in which um, we started to see farmers unionizing together, um, and these grangers started to get elected to Congress, especially out in the farming states like Mississippi and Illinois. Um, they're going to merge with the Greenback Labor Party, who has been calling for me for for more greenbacks since right after the Civil War, um, and that's going to birth the populists. The populists um, are really called the People's Party, and the populists are going to demand. Um, all of these rights um, that the West wants. This is a pro-West party. Um, government coinage uh, of silver, continue coining silver, uh, a graduated income tax. Now, we had a graduated income tax under Lincoln in the Civil War, and it was deemed unconstitutional. Um, and so, therefore, we want to reintroduce the graduated income tax. Government ownership of railroads. Wow, that's, that's socialism right there. But they're promoting something really radical because of how beholden the farmers are to railroads. Direct election of senators, which actually is a lasting impact of the populace. Um, and restricting immigration to not have to compete with immigrants. Um, and in fact, in 1892, the presidential candidate of the populace, James B. Weaver, wins 22 electoral college votes. This is one of the greatest third party showings in history. Um, and it shows us right here that this was the People's Party had some political punch and that um, the Democrats are going to have to try to appeal to these populists. And if they could appeal to these populists, um, would this create a party more powerful than the Republican Party? Um, then in 1893, we have a major panic, the Panic of 1893. It's the worst panic of the 19th century. And Cleveland is forced to call a special session of Congress to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. That means no longer can people exchange their silver for gold. Um, and this then is a way to protect the American dollars who, because there's so little gold in the vaults, um, are becoming dangerously inflated. Um, 
in desperation, Cleveland is going to need more gold in the vaults to help protect the value of the American dollar. So he's actually going to turn to the banker's banker, JP Morgan, the same guy that bought Carnegie Steel from Andrew Carnegie um, for $400 million, turned it into a U.S. Steel Corporation, the first billion dollar corporation in American history. Um, he's going to loan the U.S. government $65 million in gold. Now, this is going to be the um, really the killer for Cleveland, and this is Cleveland's second presidency. Um, it, I know it's a forgettable, forgettable president, so you get a little bit confused. So Cleveland was elected in 84, served till 88, um, and then Benjamin Harrison came in in between, and then Cleveland was elected again in 1892 to 1896. Um, and so this is his second presidency here, and, and it's so much about currency in his presidency. He repeals this Sherman Silver Purchase Act because, to protect the American dollar, but by doing this, he makes himself really, really unpopular, really for two reasons. One, because he has taken away silver from the West, and two, because he makes a deal with J.P. Morgan, which many people now think that the government is beholden to a big business leader, and they may be right. Um Cozy's army. Oh yeah, this is classic. So the Panic of 1893 um, is certainly going to strengthen the West's argument that farmers and laborers were being victimized. Um, we have repealed the Sherman um, Silver Purchase Act. This is hurting our people in debt. And so now we have these newly unemployed people and they're going to march and they're going to be rallied um, by this general Jacob Cozy. Um, he <clears throat> is going to get these 70 marchers. Um, he himself is going to ride in a carriage. Everybody else is going to march or ride bicycles and they're going to march on Washington. Um, and they are going to demand that the government issue more paper currency, what they call legal tender notes, which is just more paper currency, um, so that they can promote inflation. Um, the, this is going to be dealt with in, in a really funny way. Um, at first they can't do anything. It's the first amendment protects protesters. But they actually find a loophole as the protesters start walking on the White House grass and they are arrested for walking on the grass. And that's the end of Coxie's army. Um, 1894, uh, another revisiting of strikes and um, how unions are supposed to be strengthening. But in the Gilded Age, um, while the unions slowly strengthen, it's really all about um, the federal government favoring big business. Um, one such example is the Pullman strike of 1894. This is the Pullman Palace Car Company. It's it's a railroad company. Um, and it, the depression of 1893 has just hit. And because of this, um, we have the railroad company forced to cut workers' wages by one third. That is a considerable cut of their wages. And so we have a union leader, Eugene Debs. And we talk about Eugene Debs quite a few times in this course. This is his first step onto the scene as a union leader. He later will become a very radical socialist leader in the United States, but he's going to organize 150,000 workers and they're not only going to strike, they are going to riot. They're going to overturn rail, railway cars. They're going to tear up railroads. They're really going to make a fuss. Um, and it, because of these actions, President Cleveland is forced to step in. And even though Cleveland's a Democrat, he's a laissez-faire president. And what that means is that he doesn't believe that anything should come in and restrict free trade, and that includes unions. And so Cleveland's going to come in, dispatch this strike with federal troops, um, and Debs is sentenced to six months in jail um, for defying a court injunction. What that means is the court had said, stop doing what you're doing or you'll be arrested. He didn't stop, and so he was thrown in jail. I, ironically... Um, this six months in jail is going to make Eugene Debs turn to some really radical um, socialist literature like the Communist Manifesto, and he becomes much more radical in his time in jail. Um, all right, so the election of 1896 is one of those big elections in U.S. history, guys. Um, we've talked about a couple of the big ones. Um, in fact, we've talked about three big ones so far, four big ones. Um, the first one is the election of 1800. Thomas Jefferson. Next one's election of 1824, corrupt bargain. That's uh, John Quincy Adams is president. Uh, next is election of 1860. That's Abraham Lincoln, of course, to South secedes. And then the election of 1876, which turns into the end of Reconstruction with Rutherford B. Hayes. Um, this last election 
um, or this last key election here is just the election of 1896, which is really more than anything else, an election between big business um, and the farmers and the workers. Um, and this is monetary policy and currency is the big issue here. And the Republicans are going to put out a very, very fiscally conservative Republican, William McKinley, President McKinley. Um, he, back in um, Benjamin Harrison's day, was the sponsor of the McKinley Tariff, which was their biggest tariff in peacetime history. Um, he is fighting dramatically for gold. We do not want more paper currency out in circulation. We don't want silver out in um, in circulation. And the Democrats, they don't know what to do. Um, can they turn back to Cleveland? Cleveland's lost popularity. He crushed the Pullman strike. He borrowed money from JP Morgan. Um, and so instead they look for somebody else and out of obscurity comes William Jennings Bryan, the young 36 year old from Nebraska. Um, and he was known for being incredibly honest and a great speaker. And he gives this cross of gold speech. Um, where he was saying, you shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. He was a very biblical man. And what he was saying is, um, you are condemning the majority of the population to poverty by insisting um, that gold be the only thing that backs um, paper currency. And he is going to fight very much for silver. And he wants coinage of silver at a ratio of 16 to 1 to gold, which is twice as much as the world market. Um, by doing this, he's going to appeal to the poor, especially the West and the populace. But he is going to scare the people with more money that are going to see their value of money decrease. So he's going to scare hard money Democrats, and he's especially going to scare the Republican Party. Um, so this becomes an election that is going to directly affect the wealth of Americans in a big way. And Eastern conservatives especially are going to donate heavy for President McKinley. Um, and those donations are going to turn the tide. Um, McKinley becomes the president of the United States. It's a resounding victory for big business, big cities, financial conservatism. Um, William Jenny Bryan defeat the last time that um, a politician could try and make become president on only farmer votes, on only uh, agrarian votes. Um, okay, our last slide, the Gold Standard Act of 1900, um, that paper currency can only be redeemed in gold. Um, and yes, we are going to see some inflation that's going to help the West anyway, because we see gold coming in from Canada and Alaska and South Africa and Australia. Um, but with this, the silver issue is completely going to collapse and we won't have to talk about currency anymore. Okay, guys, here's your partner, DBQ. Um, it is on the exact things that we just talked about. In the post-Civil War United States, corporations grew significantly in number, size, and influence, analyzed the impact of big business on the economy and politics between 1865 and 1900. Crash, stop, buddy. Leave me alone. 